Good morning, everybody. I'm Nick Grewell from Columbus, Ohio. And this summer, I've been working in Dr. Trail's lab, researching the mechanism behind acid spore production and discharge in filamentous fungi by using next generation sequencing on Sorderi macrospora. This image here is what you could call a spore shooting cannon. And in a little bit, I'll go into more detail about what you're actually looking at when you see that image. So I want to begin with a broad overview of fungi. This is a kingdom of eukaryotes constituting about 1.5 million species. And since they're eukaryotes, they have nuclei, and they're actually very complex organisms. Um, so they're interesting to humans for a number of different reasons. On the one hand, they can be very beneficial to us. And they, uh, for example, they can produce food, like bakers and brewers yeasts, antibiotics like penicillin, and other enzymes that are just useful in a number of different settings. But on the other hand, they can also hurt us. And the main way they do so, economically speaking, is as pathogens of plants. In fact, most plant diseases are caused by fungi, and this means that they have significant impact on agricultural crops. In fact, fungi cause about $3 billion of losses on agricultural crops um, in, North, in North America alone every single year. So the Ascomyces are a specific group of fungi, and these are the fungi that belong to the phylum Ascomysota, which is the largest fungi phylum, and constitutes about 75% of all described fungi. Um, they're called this because they all make use of the ascus, which is a tubular sac in which spores develop, and then the sac can then propel the spores into the air to colonize new areas. So when we talk about a spore shooting <coughs> cannon, we're actually talking about a bunch of ascii within the fruiting body of a fungus. And in the case of my fungus, these fruiting bodies are called paradisia. Here's an image of the life cycle of Cerderia macrospora, which is the fungus I've been working with. Let's just begin with the mycelium. This is a mass of filaments called hyphae. And in each hyphae, um, the cells are haploid. And so for my fungus, they contain about seven chromosomes. And then as the hyphae grow, they come into contact, depicted here, and they can fuse together to form fruiting bodies, or parathesia, the cells of which have 14 chromosomes, seven from each of the two hyphae. These fruiting bodies then develop and produce spores through meiosis. So the spores are haploid. Um, they fire the spores, the spores germinate, and the cycle starts all over again. It's important to note that my fungus is what we could call homothallic, which means it can self-fertilize. So two hyphae of the same strain are able to actually form a fruiting body. Whereas other, some other fungi are heterothallic, which means that it has to be separate or different individuals that are um, forming a fruiting body. Here's a closer look at a fruiting body or parathesium. So you see that there are a bunch of ascii within it, and in each ascus is eight spores as well as epiplasmic fluid. Then when it, the fungus fires its spores, the ascii burst and shoot their contents, the spores and the fluid, up through the osteole into the air to colonize new areas. Here's an image of the life cycle of a different fungus called Fusarium graminearum that's very similar to mine. And this fungus is a major, major pathogen of um, wheat, barley, and corn. I'm not gonna go into uh, the details of all these steps because it's not all important, but I wanted to highlight this step. So basically the parathesia can form at the bottom of the plant over the winter, and in the spring they're able to fire the spores up and basically cover the entire plant, giving the fungus plenty of access into the vasculature from a number, number of different infection pathways. So this is all just to show that the spore shooting mechanism is very important to a lot of fungi, fungi's abilities to be pathogens of agricultural crops. <coughs> so I want to talk a little bit about the actual mechanism behind spore shooting. It's a pretty extraordinary mechanism. In fact, about um, it's been described in the fungus I was just working with that it can accelerate its spores at about 8.5 million meters per second squared, which is the greatest acceleration described in any living system to date. So clearly it's a pretty extraordinary mechanism. And since 1887, it's been identified as being driven by turgor pressure, which is when the cell membrane of a cell um, pushes against the cell wall, and then that pressure is able to burst and thereby fire the contents. Um, and this has since been confirmed. Two, two experiments that were done in my lab pretty recently identified two calcium ion channels, CCH1 and MID1, that are able to cause a buildup of osmotic pressure in the epiplasmic fluid. And so it's been proven that these ion channels are very critical to ascospore discharge, thus showing that turbo pressure is a major component of the mechanism. But there are also other pieces that are involved. In 1971, Reynolds described 
how microfibrils on the wall of the ASCUS are able to rapidly change alignment at the same precisely coordinated instant, which forces all the spores out at the same time. Uh, and in 1993, two other scientists described an array of actin microfilaments and microtubules, and these can facilitate ejection of the spores by forcing everything out in one cohesive unit, which reduces drag. Um, and speaking of drag, a different lab in 2008 described how the spore shape of these fungi is precisely shaped to minimize drag. Essentially, um, if the spores were shaped even a little bit differently, they wouldn't be able to go anywhere because of the high drag forces involved. And to imagine what the drag forces are like for these fungi, imagine trying to throw a balloon. Like even if you throw it really hard, it won't really go anywhere because it's so light and the air resistance is so much um, relatively greater. So this is all just to say that it's a very complex mechanism that drives spore shooting. And it hasn't yet been completely elucidated in any fungus. So basically, we think there's still a lot of components of it that um, are worth investigation. So now I'm going to talk about a method I'll use to actually investigate this mechanism. It's called next generation sequencing, or whole genome sequencing. And you can use this to locate causative mutations on the genome of an organism. Basically, figure out what <coughs> mutation you're looking at. So this has only been developed in the last few years due to recent advances in bioinformatics technology. And the basic, and the nice thing about it is you don't need a lot of prior mapping information about the organism you're working with. All you really need is a solid reference genome. So consequently, this can be applied to a broad number of different organisms. Um, and the basic idea is you take a bunch of short reads from your subject population, um, and then you align these reads to the reference genome. And through doing that, you can then compare all your reads to the reference genome and see where the key difference is with your subject. Uh, a study published earlier this year, in February, showed that this technique is very useful for fungi. And in fact, they actually did the study on the same fungus that I'm working with, Sorderia macrosphora. And they said that it works so well because these fungi have a relatively small genome and there's not too much repetition compared to, say, higher eukaryotes like us. We have a lot more rep repetition in our genomes. So what this means is we can use this technique to locate causative mutations on the genome in Sorderia macrosphora. So if we had a sporulation restricted mutant, um, we could use this technique and learn why exactly that mutant isn't able to sporulate properly, which would thereby tell us a lot about the actual mechanism behind sporulation. And so that's where the PER43 mutant comes in. So this is a mutant strain that was induced from the wild type through ultraviolet mutagenesis and kindly provided by some researchers in Germany. And by the way, wild type just means like the standard reference strain of any given organism. So basically, this mutant can't make spores properly. Uh, this, this picture isn't displaying too well, but you can see how the spores labeled A are kind of really pale and kind of oblong. And these are the mutant spores compared to the spores labeled B, which are the wild type spores and which are black and circular. Uh, here's an image where it's a little clearer to see the differences with this mutant. So what you're looking at here is a bunch of ASCII radially aligned. So remember, each ASCII is just a, a uh, is just a line of eight spores, basically. So the wild type's over here. So you're looking at just a bunch of ASCII in a ASCII in a circle. Note how each ASCII has about it has eight spores, and they're all very uh, uniformly shaped. They're all black and circular, and there are always eight spores per ASCII. This is the same exact thing for the mutant. Notice how. Um, the spores are very, very irregularly shaped. Some are very long, others are much shorter, and there aren't always, there actually there are almost never eight spores per ASCUS. So basically there's a whole lot of inconsistencies, and basically this mutant is just having a lot of trouble actually producing spores the way the wild type can. Here's another image of the mutant spores. This is at twice, the, note that this is twice the magnification of the last picture. And here you can really see the problems this mutant's having with producing its spores. Know how they, like, this spore is really long. I mean, some others are more medium sized. Then there's some tiny ones in here. And basically, all, and there are very random numbers of spores for ASCUS. So, this is all to show you that this mutant, PER43, is having a lot of trouble producing spores. And basically, the aim of my project is to figure out why this mutant is having so much trouble producing spores, which will actually tell us more about the mechanism behind spore, spore production and discharge in the fungus. So here are the methods I'm going to use to accomplish that goal. I have two strains, which I just talked about, the wild type and the PER43 mutant. So what I want to do is backcross PER43 twice against the wild type, which should help to purify away extraneous mutations that I'm not interested in. So 
so I can focus on the one mutation that's um, causing its sporulation capabilities to be so messed up. And here's exactly what I mean when I talk about those two back crosses. This is a cross diagram of my study. So um, it all began with ultraviolet mutagenesis, which created the PER43 strain. And I crossed that against the wild type. By the way, KL10222 is just like a reference number for the strain. So I cross that against the wild type, and I get from that cross, I was able to get one offspring isolate that showed the pale misshapen spore phenotype. So basically, it inherited the PER43 mutation. But hopefully, it shouldn't have inherited all the other random mutations that the original PER43 strain might have had. So you can see I'm just trying to purify away extra stuff. So I cross that isolate against the wild type again to further purify away extraneous mutations. And from that cross, I can get, uh, I've been getting about 15 or 20 isolates that, again, show the pale misshapen spore phenotype. So once again, they did inherit the PER43 mutation. And then from that cross, I also take a group of 15 to 20 isolates that show the standard black spore phenotype. So they did not inherit the mutation, but they probably inherited other random mutations. So basically, I can compare these two groups against one another. And basically, I want to find out what the one key difference is that's causing that this group has and this group doesn't, that's causing this group to produce its spores so weirdly. So to continue with my methods, so I obtained those two groups from the last cross. I, uh, I pooled the DNA of the two groups, and I sequenced that pooled DNA. I aligned the reads and I analyzed them, and I'll go into that stuff uh, in, a, in a minute. First, I want to talk about the actual method I used for my strain crossings. So here you see a petri dish um, in which are two strains of Cerderia macrospora, one on the left, one on the right, and you can kind of see the contact line between the, where the two of them meet up. Um, and it's here it is penciled in, so it's easier to see. So note how there are a lot of black dots all throughout the dish. Those are parathesia, or fruiting bodies, and remember how my fungus is homothallic, so it can self-fertilize, therefore parathesia form throughout the entire dish. Um, <coughs> but there are gonna be parathesia forming along this line that are actually formed when one hypha of one strain and one hypha of another um, meet together and fuse. So as you can see, the, the uh, offspring spores from those parathesia are going to actually have, uh, are actually going to be the offspring of the cross because they inherit half of their DNA from one strain and half from the other. So here's a different plate. This is a cross of the wild type and the PER43 mutant, and it's pretty easy to see the contact line right here. So once again, the parathesia that form on that contact line are going to have, um, are going to be, are going to be the offspring of the two different strains. So that's what we're interested in when I'm trying to get the offspring of the strains for my strain crossings. Here's that same dish with the lid on. Um, and this lid has the accumulated spores that have been discharged over the last like two weeks or so. So notice how the left side of the lid is completely black and just completely covered because it's been completely covered with all the wild type spores from the wild type. But the right side of the dish is completely clear because recall that the PER43 mutant can't produce normal spores to fire on the lid. Um, so here I've drawn with a Sharpie the contact line on the lid. And notice how there are some spores that kind of bleed over onto the PER43 side right along here. So those are the spores I'm interested in. Because remember that the uh, recombinant parathesia, or the parathesia that are the offspring of the two, um, of the two strains, are going to be formed on the contact line. And they're the rightmost parathesia that can still fire spores. Because the PER43 parathesia can't fire spores at all. So basically what I do is I scrape off the spores that are the rightmost spores, so like right along here. I scrape them off, I plate them on germination medium, I allow them to germinate, and then I can cut them out individually, grow them up, and see which ones have the mutation. And that's how I went forward with my crosses. So the final step of the project, I isolate the DNA from those two groups, I sequence it with Illumina selects the short reads, paired end reads. I align it with bow tie to the reference genome, and then I can call or locate small SNPs or indels, so basically the mutations, using a program called SAM tools. As for where I am right now, I'm currently isolating the DNA from those two groups. Obviously today is the last day of the program, so we're going to sequence it, and then I'll be able to do the rest of the steps once I go back. So that's in the future. So like I just said, so basically I don't have any results yet because the sequencing hasn't even happened yet, but here's the projected conclusion for where my project will go. So say I locate the mutation on the genome, so I figure out what mutation is actually causing the PER43 mutant to have messed up sporulation capabilities. 
Through doing that, I learned what gene exactly is responsible for this weird phenotype. So I actually learned what protein is so necessary for the fungus to have that if it doesn't, if it's messed up, it can't produce spores like at all. And through doing that, I should hopefully learn more about what mechanism exactly is a crucial, crucial piece of sporulation in the fungus. So from there, the future research would be undertaken probably by collaborators in Germany who would um, do plasmic complementation, basically just to double check my results and make sure the mutation location I found is correct. And then the future future research would be uh, actually learning how to stop the discovered mechanism because remember the main goal of this entire project is to find out how to stop these fungi from being such pervasive crop pathogens. All right, here's a nice picture of a wheat farm that could one day be benefited by this research. <laughs> um, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Chael first and foremost for taking me into her lab and just providing tons of mentorship and guidance to me every step of the way. Also, every member of the Trail Lab who contributed to my research by teaching me how to do all this stuff and just produce, just creating a really great lab environment. Also, Dr. Richmond and the HSHSP for providing me with this opportunity, and lastly, the NSF for funding this work. Thank you. Questions for Nick? No questions. Peter, did you have a question? <laughs> 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 or you just. talk about the sort of immediate next steps. How mm -hmm. long, I mean, obviously it take, you never know how long these things are gonna take, but. Right, yeah, yeah. so I'm isolating the DNA right now, mm -hmm. and that should probably just go on for like another week or so, maybe a little more. And then from there, we have to send it to the sequencing facility. Right. And the sequencing facility could take anywhere from one to six weeks, really. So it's all kind of dependent on that and what their workflow is and how I fit sure. into that. And then from there, hopefully the data analysis shouldn't take too long, but. We'll see. So I'd say the outlook probably maybe a month, maybe a little more. We'll see. Any other questions for Nick? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>